Good morning. Welcome to Osco Community Church. My name is Pastor Paul. We are delighted to have you with us today. We have a lot of announcements this morning. A lot of things going on or coming up that we want you to be aware of. Uh, before I forget to announce, I will hopefully remember later, but just in case I don't, uh, the high school and junior high class and the class that has been meeting next to the gym for the James uh, Sunday school, you are all meeting in one classroom in the old part of the church upstairs next to the normal junior high, senior high class. Got it? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> all right, also happening today, we are having soup and prayer tonight. Um, time when we can get together, have some fellowship, but also then, uh, more importantly, uh, pray together and pray for our church, pray for our community. We invite everybody to come for that. Soup will be provided. Robin, what are we having? Um, tortellini soup. Tortellini soup. There you go. Sounds great. All right. So that's happening tonight. Uh, today is the last day to sign up for Iron Sharpens Iron, a uh, men's conference happening on March 2nd. Uh, so I encourage you guys, if, if at all possible, please plug into that. It's a great opportunity for us. Cost for that is $59. Uh, students, uh, we are willing to pay your ticket. So if you are age 13 through 22, we will pay your way free. We want you to be able to go and plug into that. Uh, ladies, your Iron Sharpens Iron is going to be coming up very soon, too. So more information will be coming on that, uh, that conference coming up. Uh, also, another great opportunity is uh, a Go and Tell um, Ministries is going to be coming, and uh, we're going to be hosting an evangelism workshop uh, on May 6th, uh, May, March 16th. A uh, great opportunity for uh, us to learn, to grow in how can we practically share our faith with people uh, and relationships that we already have, or how to form those relationships better and point them to Christ. Uh, so please. Please, 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 please consider coming to that. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us as a church to grow in that, uh, something that we all need to do as part of the Great Commission. So hope to see you there for that. There's a sign-up sheet for that and for Iron Sharpens Iron uh, on the wall there uh, by the Information Center. Uh, also, we are getting going with uh, putting together a new photo directory. Uh, we are hoping to start that uh, next Sunday. We're going to be taking pictures in the nursery uh, during the Sunday school hour and uh, during Awana as well, if that time works better for you. Uh, but uh, if you uh, want to talk to Heidi, she has the sign-up sheet, I think. Heidi, do you have the sign-up sheet? Hopefully, yes. Yes, she does. So there you go. So you can talk to her about uh, signing up for a time slot. If you try and dodge us or run away from us, we know where you go to church. We will track you down. We will get your picture. So... Please come quietly, come well, and we appreciate your help with that. Uh, look forward to getting that all together. So, all right, let me read from Isaiah 42. This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weary or be discouraged until he has established justice on earth. The islands will wait for his instruction. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your servant. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And Lord, in him we find one like no one else. In him we find one who came fully yielded to your spirit, fully in step with you as his father. Lord, we thank you that he has come to bring justice, righteousness, Oh Lord, in a way that is so different from how we would do it, from how we try to do it so often. Or he will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed. He will not put out a smoldering wick. There's a gentleness, a meekness there. 
that we know very little of. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow in. Pray that you would help us to grasp, to see, to understand who he is and who you have called us to be as his people. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather, to worship you. We pray that you would bless us as we come before your throne. Amen. Good morning, Osco. Let's stand as we worship this morning.
thank you that you are here. Thank you that we can lift our voices, our hearts, our minds in praise to you. Thank you, God, that no matter what we've walked in this room with, we can put it aside and focus on you. No matter what has happened this week, God, thank you that you've been with us. Thank you you've walked with us, carried us at times. Thank you you've led us. And thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, I pray that through this hour, you will remind us and draw us closer to you. That we will continue to just breathe in your presence and learn more of you. As we wait upon you, Lord, as we wait for you, find us faithful, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Good morning, Asco. Today's reading will be from Psalm 37, verse 1 through 11 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. That's page 874. Let's bow in prayer before we begin. Father, again, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are all-knowing. We thank you that you are ever-powerful. We thank you that you are always with us. Today, we thank you that you have brought people into this room with the desire to know you more, to know your word. We ask that you remove all distractions from this room, that you strengthen Pastor Paul, that you would allow him to convey your word the way you would see fit. Um, and we thank you that you give us your word that we can get to know you better. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil, for the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Good morning again. Good morning. All right, please join me in prayer once again. Father God, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you love us. We thank you that even though we are selfish and sinful and broken, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. To take the punishment that we deserved. To be raised in victory over sin and death so that we could be saved and forgiven. And Lord, we pray that you would help us this morning as we come again to your word. That we would have ears to hear it. Have a heart to understand it. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see Jesus this morning, maybe in a way that we've never seen him before. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see him, to worship him, to follow him, to know him more. And we pray that you would do this by your Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Two men faced each other on the pavement before the governor's palace. One of them was Jesus, the meekest man who ever lived. The other was Pontius Pilate, a man of pride and the power and authority to back it up. Jesus appeared as the epitome of weakness, a poor Jew caught on the unrelenting tides of Roman history, frail and impotent. A man beaten and spat upon, betrayed by his friends, destined to endure the cruelty and shame of being executed on the cross. In contrast, Pilate was the personification of Roman power and authority. History was with him. He had every earthly advantage over Jesus. As part of Rome, he was heir to the world. Power, authority, position were all seemingly his. And yet these, men's, these men were at opposite ends of a paradox. Because Jesus Christ, the prisoner, was actually the free man. He was the one in absolute control there according to his plan. And Jesus, the meek, would inherit not only the earth but the universe. 
On the other hand, Pilate, the governor, was the prisoner of his own pride. All the power of Rome would have to bend to the shouts of the mob. He would not even control his own soul. He had no inheritance. He had no power except that which was given to him and would be taken from him. Jesus didn't just teach the paradox, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He also lived it. We are in the midst of a series looking at the Beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew 5. There, Jesus gives us a description and commendation of the good life, a life blessed by God that is truly life at its very best. In these words, Jesus is offering and inviting his hearers into a way of being in the world that will result in their true and full flourishing, both now and in the age to come. And then we are pointed to life and ultimately the source of life, Jesus himself. But as we've already seen and will continue to see the further we go with them, these words are far from what we'd expect. They are counterintuitive, countercultural. They are upside down from what comes naturally to us, what this world has taught us from when we were little. And that's certainly the case with our beatitude today about the meek of all people being blessed and inheriting the earth. Now, you might hear or read that, and if you're honest, you might just want to skip right over that one. Because, I mean, who is interested in being meek? When it comes to the qualities that you or I might aspire to be or to grow in, when it comes to the things we want to be known for or remembered, when it comes to the traits that we hope our kids will one day grow up to possess, the word meek isn't usually on any of those lists. Most of us think of a meek person as someone who is timid, spineless, unassertive, someone easily dominated or intimidated, someone who speaks softly and gets hit with a big stick, a person so unsure of themselves that they could be pushed over by a hard slap from a wet noodle. Okay, that's a little bit funny. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> we naturally think that meek people don't get anywhere because everybody just ignores them or else rides roughshod over them or tramples them underfoot. It's the tough, the aggressive who succeed in the struggle for existence, not the weaklings, not the losers. After all, fortune favors the bold. It seems far truer to say, blessed are the proud and confident, the intimidating and aggressive, those who assert themselves, who are strong, who conquer and dominate, who refuse to submit, who have the strength of will and superior power, you know, the winners. It makes sense that they are the ones who will inherit the earth. That's how the real world works, after all. Just look at who occupy executive suites. Those who succeed in business or politics, the strong, the self-sufficient, the overbearing, the capable, the aggressive, the ambitious. We can talk about being meek in church. It's a nice thought. Put it on a greeting card. In the real world, it's survival of the fittest, not the meekest. No, but the last thing most people want to be known for is meekness. And yet Jesus, with both his words and his life, point to it as the way to life and blessing and flourishing. And as our Lord and Savior, we do well to take his word seriously. Because as we're going to see this morning, only the meek will one day inherit what others grasp to possess now. <clears throat> this concept of meekness is so left field for us in our culture, in our world. And so I think it's important for us to look at it on a few different levels this morning, kind of zeroing in on it as we go. So we're going to first look at what meekness is and isn't. Then secondly, paint some pictures of what it looks like lived out and what the meek do and are. Thirdly, we need to see where meekness is perfectly found. And then lastly, look at what the meek will enjoy 
But first, and that's all in your notes, first, and if you like blanks, this morning is for you. Here we go. First, we have to understand what meekness is and isn't. First, what it isn't. Meekness is not weakness or being passive. It doesn't denote cowardice or spinelessness or timidity or the willingness to have, well, I just got to have peace at any cost, so let's just do whatever to get that. Neither does meekness suggest indecisiveness or wishy-washiness or a lack of confidence. Meekness doesn't imply shyness or a withdrawn personality, nor can it be reduced to just being a nice and agreeable person who everybody likes. Meekness goes a lot deeper than that. It is compatible with strength and power, with courage and resiliency. The Greek adjective translated meek means gentle, humble, considerate, courteous, exercising self-control in all these ways. In many ways, it is humble, gentle strength under control. That's a short definition. Humble, gentle strength under control. It was a word used to describe tame animals. Aristotle explained that it is the mean or the perfect balance between excessive anger and excessive angerlessness or passivity. So the man who is meek is able to balance his anger, his strength under control. The meek person is strong, gentle, and meek, but in control of himself. He is strong as steel, but gentle. When you think of all the stuff that churns in our hearts and minds, how hard is it to be that perfect balance of anger or anger between anger and angerlessness? How easy is it to give in to that anger rising up in our hearts when something happens? To let our thoughts be driven by envy or jealousy or lust or some other desire? To be driven this way or that by temptation? There's so much in us that is selfishness and sin and vice that needs to be tamed and brought to heal and controlled. How do we do that? Part of the answer is the calm strength of meekness. After all, why are we in awe of what lion tamers are able to accomplish? Their power isn't found in violence, in raising their voice, or in making dramatic displays, but a confident calmness a meekness, a gentle strength that somehow controls the ferocious animal. That's what we need also. So boiling it down, what is meekness? The definition in your bulletin is too long. I apologize. It's an amalgamation of different ideas that I think are helpful, though, to consider as we look at meekness. The first half of it, meekness is a humble attitude toward others that flows from a true estimation of ourself before God. Uh, This is where we need to look back for a second at the previous two Beatitudes. The order is significant. They aren't just haphazardly arranged here. We're never going to get to meekness if we skip over poverty of spirit and mourning. The first step, the beatitude, begins with poverty of spirit, seeing and recognizing that in our sin we are spiritual beggars before God. We realize that there is nothing within us that could commend us to God. We fall short. We need God. And in this, we see ourselves with true knowledge. And having seen our need and poverty, we naturally progress to the next beatitude of mourning, lamenting our state of spiritual poverty. And it's in that fertile soil, emptied out of pride, of poverty of spirit and of mourning, that meekness can best grow. Because we see ourselves as we truly are before God, we're then able to respond with humility to God and to others. Because we mourn our own sin and fallenness, we are more ready to extend grace and tenderness and forgiveness to others in theirs. But we'll never get to meekness unless we are poor in spirit, unless we mourn, unless we first see our own need for grace and forgiveness as a sinner. So meekness is a humble attitude toward others that flows from a true estimation of ourselves before God, but it's also a gentle strength governed by the Holy Spirit. It is tender steel, strength under control, Guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. The meek are those who say to their king, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. 
They give the Lord Jesus a blank check and, decide, and delightedly ask him to fill out whatever he wants in there. A meek person is not a weak person, but a person strong in Christ. It is knowing who God is and who we are as his children and living in complete dependence and total submission to him, yielding fully to his will, not our own. As Sinclair Ferguson summarizes, meekness is the humble strength that belongs to the man who has learned to submit to difficulties, difficult experiences, and difficult people, knowing that in everything God is working for his good. The meek man is the one who has stood before God's judgment and abdicated or surrendered all his supposed rights. He has learned in gratitude for God's grace to submit himself to the Lord and to be gentle with sinners. The opposite of this meekness is an arrogant, a rough handling of power and authority. People who wield power without any respect or regard for God or the people under their authority. The ruthless person, the person who does whatever it takes to achieve what they want, who is unafraid of excessive force or power to accomplish their goals, is the opposite of meekness. Kent Hughes gives four helpful checks on our heart, four qualities that are the opposite of meekness that I think are helpful to hold up to ourselves and be warned by. First, harshness. If you are mean in your treatment of others, if there is an absence of gentleness in your treatment of others, take heed. Second, grasping. If you you make sure that you always get yours first, if looking out for number one is the subtle driving force of your life, If you care very little about how your actions affect others, beware. Third, vengeful. If you are known as someone never to cross, if you always get your pound of flesh, be on your guard. Fourth, uncontrolled. If rage fills your soul so that life is a series of explosions occasioned by the fools in your life, watch out. None of us are perfect in all that. But if these qualities, these four, are part of your character, if they are a regular part of your conduct, your attitude, your actions, your words toward other people, if you are a self-satisfied Christian who thinks that the lack of gentleness and meekness is just who you are and people have to get used to it, no, that's sin. That's selfishness controlling you. If you're not repentant of these things, if there is not even a hint of any gentleness or meekness in your spirit, even imperfectly present there, that's a problem. I think there's reason to question your salvation. So that hopefully gives us a good starting point, at least for understanding this very foreign concept of meekness. But let's look at some helpful descriptions of what the meek do and are. The first one is found in Psalm 37, which Kevin read for us before. I would encourage you to turn there in your own copies of God's Word. There we are going to see that the meek trust God, commit their way to God, and wait for God. The closest parallel we have in the Old Testament to our beatitude this morning is in Psalm 37, verse 11. It's almost certain that this beatitude is a quotation or an allusion to it. Psalm 37, verse 11 says, But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. And the context leading up to that verse is helpful in fleshing out our understanding of what meekness does, what it looks like. Also in answering the question of, Okay, God, why are you why are you giving your inheritance and blessing to the meek of all people? I think this passage helps us humongously in that. So let's read through again the first ten verses of this psalm. And as we go, make note of the descriptions of what the meek do or don't do. See if you can see why the meek obtain God's blessing. Verse one. Do not fret because of those who are evil. 
or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The Israelites to whom the psalm was written despite living in the land, did not truly possess it because of the working of evil men and women. And what were they to do about that? In a word, trust. Verse 3, verse 5. A deep trust in the sovereign power of God is a foundational key to meekness. They don't fret because of those who are evil or doing evil. They aren't envious of those who do wrong, verse 1 and verse 7. No, they trust in God. And because of that, they don't have to fight back. They can leave the fighting to God. They can focus on doing what God has called them to do and be. They can commit their way to God and follow him, verse 5. Because they have a deep, deep confidence that God is going to handle the rest. The meek people have discovered that God is trustworthy. And so they can cast their cares and worries on him. They readily admit that they are insufficient to cope with the complexities and pressures and obstacles of life. But they look to God. They trust that he is up to the task. They trust that God is willing and able to sustain them and guide them and protect them. Meek people are quiet and still before the Lord, and they patiently wait for him. That doesn't mean that they are lazy or do nothing. It means they are free from frenzy. They have a steady calm that that comes from knowing that God is in control. That he has their affairs and the affairs of others and the affairs of the whole world and universe under his control. And that he is gracious and will work all things out for the best. Meek people have a quiet steadiness about their lives in the midst of upheaval. They don't fret themselves over the wicked who seem to prosper and win. Verse 8, they refrain from anger. Their family, their work, their life and world, all of it is in God's sovereign hand. They trust God. They wait patiently and quietly to see how his power, his goodness will work things out. And so the setbacks and the obstacles and the opponents of life don't produce in them the kind of bitterness and anger and vitriol and fretfulness and worry that is so common in our day. I hope you can see in all this that meekness has a whole lot to do with God and our trust in Him. And if we don't have that meekness, are we really trusting God? Or are we trusting our own strength or our abilities or whatever else? Let's look at another picture of what the meek do and are. The meek refrain from revenge and defensiveness. We, I mean, we, don't, we can just skip this one. We all don't struggle with that at all, right? Right, okay. This one's found in Numbers 12. There are many great examples of this deep trust in God, this gentle strength under the control of the Holy Spirit, this humble attitude toward others that flows from a true estimation of ourselves before God that we can turn to in the Old Testament. You think of Abraham's deferring to Lot in Genesis 13. That was meekness. You see it in David's patient endurance of the unjust and unkind treatment by Saul. Even though he had been anointed, he was looking and waiting on God and his timing. You see it in Jeremiah, faithful to speak the truth that God had given him, even though he didn't want to. Even though others were saying much better things to hear. 
easier things to hear. There was a strength yielded to the Spirit of God there, though. But the best example of meekness in the whole Old Testament is Moses. And I know that because the Bible tells me so. In Numbers 12, verse 3, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Or as your translation might have, some do, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Now, we need to look at the the verses around this to understand why this comment is significant. But we also need to say up front that Moses certainly doesn't fit the stereotype of meekness being weakness or passivity. It's hard to find a person in the Old Testament with greater strength of character than Moses. His courage as a leader was astonishing. God gave him the burden of leading the nation of Israel up out of slavery. He stood face to face against the most powerful ruler in the ancient world, Pharaoh of Egypt. He withstood the constant complaints, even the rebellions of the people of Israel in the wilderness. And yet that Moses was noted for his meekness in this passage. But his life also teaches us that this was not his natural disposition. Meekness comes naturally to no one. Certainly not to Moses. It was a quality that God had wrought in him over many years and with great patience. You can't microwave meekness. You can't pick it up at a drive through window. In earlier days, Moses had been self-sufficient, self-willed. Acts 7, 24 and 25 indicate that Moses had a sense that God was calling him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But when he tried to do it in his own way, in his own strength, by murdering an Egyptian, it didn't work. It took 40 years in the loneliness and isolation of the desert, 40 years of tending sheep rather than shepherding Israel for God to refine his character. He had plenty of time during that time, I'm sure, to reflect on his sin to mourn over it, to learn patience and submission to the will of God, to learn humility and strength yielded to God. And we see that meekness at work in Numbers 12, which begins by describing an occasion when Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses severely. Let's read it. Numbers 12. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble or meek man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out of the tent, to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. And what happens in the following verses is that the Lord rebukes Miriam and Aaron and vindicates his servant Moses. But what's the point of calling Moses humble or meek in that spot right there in the middle of it? It really breaks up the flow of what's happening. Right smack between the bitter opposition and God vindicating Moses. Why interrupt it with that comment? Because going back to Psalm 37, Moses was looking to God. He was trusting in God, waiting on God. He was committing his cause to God. He was letting God be his defender. Just where we would expect the text to tell us what Moses said to justify himself against the charge of Miriam and Aaron. How he told them off or pushed back or gave them a piece of his mind. The text tells us that Moses was the meekest man on earth. He didn't say a word. Instead, he patiently waited for the Lord, and God came to his defense. And so the meek refrained from revenge and defensiveness. Meekness leaves its vindication to God. Meekness is the strength, the fortitude, the courage to absorb adversity and criticism without lashing back. This world knows very little of that strength. John Calvin also writes about it. The meek are the calm and quiet ones who are not easily provoked by wrongs, who do not sulk over offenses, but are more ready to endure everything than pay the wicked the same back. 
What do the meek do? They trust in God. They commit their way to God. They wait for God. And because of that, they refrain from revenge and defensiveness. Third picture of what the meek do and are. I'm cheating on this one. It's a splattering of a few different passages and ideas. But the meek are teachable, are wise, and they know their fallibility. I just kind of mushed them all into one point because the outline's long enough as it is. So we're just going to fly through these, but they're important, I think. First, the meek are teachable. We see that in James 1, 19 through 21. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. But what if I know I'm right? Everyone should be quick to listen. What if the other person is a moron? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That, that's a picture of meekness. That's what Moses did. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept or meekly receive the word planted in you which can save you. James has two kinds of people in mind in this passage. On the one hand, there's the kind of person who does not like to listen to what other people have to say, especially if they speak with any authority. This person is quick to speak and quick to become angry if the words of others cross his or her opinion or call his or her behavior into question. He is not receptive to the word of God. He filters it through his own desires and agenda and receives it selectively, if at all. On the other hand, James pictures another kind of person. They are slow to speak and quick to listen. This person recognizes the limitations of his or her knowledge, the fallibility of his or her thinking, and so is eager to listen and learn anything valuable he can from others. If he hears something new or contrary to his own view, his first reaction is not fretful anger, not canceling vengeance. He is slow to anger. He listens and considers, and when it comes to the word of God, he receives it with humility, with meekness, strength yielded to the control of the Spirit. And so to be meek is to be teachable. It doesn't mean that we are gullible, nor does it mean that we never get angry about what some people are saying or teaching. But we're slow to anger. As John Piper summarizes, meekness does not mean the absence of passion and conviction and even indignation for the glory of God. But it does mean that we don't have hair triggers. It does mean that our disposition is one of readiness to listen and learn. It does mean that we are slow to write a person off, slow to condemn, slow to anger. Meekness, the meek are teachable. The meek are also wise. The truly wise person are also the truly meek people. James fleshes this out for us further down on his letter in James 3, verse 13 and 17, where he contrasts the wisdom of this world with the wisdom from above. There we read, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Did you notice that the wisdom that comes from heaven has a bunch of the same qualities that is used to describe meekness? Pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Usually we think of wisdom as just, well, knowing the answers, perceiving things intellectually. It's a head thing, but it's a heart thing too. You can know all the answers and still be a fool. That's why meekness, why seeing ourselves with humble accuracy and submission to God is really the other side of the coin of wisdom. Both are peaceable and gentle. Both are strong. Going along these lines, the meek are, also know their fallibility. They humbly see their poverty of spirit. They mourn their sin. They know their limits. They, how easy it is for them themselves to slip into sin. So 
Not only is meekness slow to anger and slow to speak, but when they decide they must speak, even with words of correction, they speak with a deep awareness that they themselves are sinners. As we read in Galatians 6, 1, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently or in a spirit of meekness. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. The meek know their own faults, how easy it is for them to sin. It's not, how could those people do that? It's, but for the grace of God, there go I. And so in conflict, the meek take the log out of their own eye before they go and talk to somebody about the speck of dust in theirs. All while readily admitting that apart from the free and undeserved grace of God, that they are going to fall in the same sin that they are trying to correct. And so there's some pictures of what the meek do and are. They trust in God. They commit their way to God. They wait for God. They refrain from revenge and defensiveness. They are teachable, ready to listen and learn. Wise. They know their fallibility. Meekness is a humble attitude toward others that flows from a true estimation of self before God. A gentle strength governed by the Holy Spirit. That's a lot. It's a lot to live up to. Who can be and do all this? Only one person ever did, which brings us to our third point, maybe the most important point of all. No, no maybe about that. It is the most important point of all. Where we find meekness perfectly is in Jesus. Few today might aspire to be meek, but did you know that it's a word that Jesus used to describe himself and his heart, the central heartbeat of what drived him and defined him? In the four gospel accounts given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have 89 chapters of biblical text. But there is only one place where Jesus directly tells us about his own heart and what's in there, what drives it, what motivates it. It's found in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For I am gentle and humble in heart. The Greek word translated gentle here occurs just three other times in the New Testament. Guess where one of them is? Matthew 5.5, 5, our beatitude today, blessed are the meek. Oh, that's Jesus. Another is in the prophecy of Matthew 21, verse 5, which is quoting from Zechariah about Jesus, the Messiah, coming humbly, meekly, on a, riding on a donkey. It was a mark of the Messiah. The, the third is in Peter's encouragement to wives to nurture more than anything else the hidden person of their heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle, a meek spirit. Meek. Humble, gentle. Jesus is not trigger happy. He's not harsh or reactionary or ruthless or easily exasperated. Jesus is not selfishly grasping after things. We read in Philippians 2 that he did not consider equality with God something to be selfishly grasped or used or leveraged to his own advantage. But instead, he humbled himself. He became a man. He lived a human life. And then even more humility. He died the cruel, shameful, undeserved death of the cross. There in Jesus is strength yielded to God under the control of the Spirit. There in Jesus we find resiliency and courage. Even in the face of great opposition, he refrained from revenge and defensiveness. He put his trust in God, committed his way to God, waited for God, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When he was mocked and spat upon, he didn't answer back, but trusted his father. There's no greater humility, no greater gentle strength under the control of the Spirit than we find in Christ. As Peter Kreeft writes, to see what meekness is, you must look not at meekness, but at Christ. 
saying meekness is this or that sends you to concepts which are copies of reality. Saying Jesus is meek sends you to the living reality himself. And again, this meekness is far from weakness. Jesus stood against the entire power structure of his day, resisting public opinion, resisting political and religious authorities. He was abandoned by his friends, rejected by his own people. He endured unbelievable pain and torture at the hands of his captors. And through it all, he stayed the course, yielded to God. He was stronger than steel. There were times when the Pharisees needed to be called out or the money changers' tables overturned. There were other times when the weak and broken needed his compassion or the repentant needed his forgiveness. And in each case, his power and authority was tempered according to the needs of the people he was dealing with. It was gentle strength, tender steel, governed by the Holy Spirit. He is the incarnation of meekness. When it came to matters of faith and the welfare of others, Jesus was a lion. And yet, when it came to his own defense, he was a lamb. He willingly laid down his life for others in self-giving love. And so, if you see a decided lack of meekness in your heart and life today, look to Jesus. Yoke yourself to him. Take his yoke upon you and learn from him. I used to yoke young ox to experienced older oxen to help show him the way. Let him show you the way. For he is meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. You can stop striving and fighting and scrambling in the ruthless harshness, the grasping, the vengefulness, the uncontrolled way of this world. You can instead find rest down to your very soul because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Yoke yourself to Jesus. Walk near and close to him. Look to him as your Savior and Lord for eternity and for, day, for today. And you'll learn gentleness and humility. You'll grow in traits this world knows very little about but are of eternal value. As Sinclair Ferguson notes, there is probably no more beautiful quality in a Christian than meekness. It enhances manliness. It adorns femininity. It is a jewel polished by grace. But is meekness worth the trouble, the cost, the pain? Well, let's look at the rest of that verse. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Only the meek will one day inherit what others grasp to possess now. Uh, what will the meek enjoy? Our fourth point. Again, there's an already not yet fully aspect to this promise. Because in one sense, the meek will enjoy blessed contentment even now. When in humility we are yielded to God, we don't feel the need to defend our pride or reputation. Our ego isn't so inflated that we think that we have to have more and more. Our significance and security aren't wrapped up in our next accomplishment or conquest. We don't frantically grasp after things that this world fights for. Why? Because we already know that we have all that we need in Christ. There's a blessed contentment we can enjoy even now because of that. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. So that no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours! Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Stop boasting, Paul says, in this or that other worldly thing or advantage. So what? We, you already got everything in Christ. You don't need the vain pleasures of one-upmanship because God has already made you an heir of the world. There's no point in debating or bragging or competing that well, my house is bigger than your house when we know that God owns it all anyway. And you're in the will. So you're going to get it anyway. Who cares? The meek don't have to scramble and fight and try to grasp the things that this world claws and fights over because we already have it all in Christ. And so they can enjoy blessed contentment but even more, they also enjoy a confident hope for the future. Because Jesus is coming back to set all things right. 
He will return to vindicate and save us. He will return and bring us to be with him forever. And so in the midst of the pain and sacrifice that meekness requires, we can have confident hope knowing that in the end it will all be worth it, knowing that just as we share in his sufferings today for a little while, so someday we will share in his glory forever. We will reign and rule with him, 2 Timothy 2, 12. Or as we read in 1 Peter 3 through 6, or 1, 3 through 6, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. But what if this happens in my life? What if this happens in the world that can never perish, spoil, or fade? This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. We can endure the pain and cost and sacrifice of meekness, not only because of the blessed contentment we have in Christ now, but because we have a confident hope in our inheritance to come, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The meek person, instead of snatching or grabbing to possess what we can conquer in this world is patient to wait for the inheritance that God promises. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Only the meek will one day inherit what others grasp to possess now. But we'll never become meek by our own effort. If you're thinking, well, I just got to knuckle down on this to really get after this. It's not going to happen. Only through Jesus will we get there. Only through going to him who is meek and lowly in heart. Jesus alone can do in you what you think is impossible. He can teach you meekness and you can find rest for your soul. Blessed contentment in the here and now and confident hope for the future. Through him and the Holy Spirit at work in your life by grace, you can grow in meekness. This gentle strength yielded to God in humility. This strength that frees us to see Others' interests advance instead of our own. That strength that frees us to sacrificially give and love while we put our trust in God and look to his victory and inheritance. I know I've thrown a lot at you this morning. I want to leave you with one last picture of meekness. It's in Jackie Robinson. Branch Rickey president and general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, wanted to break the color barrier in professional baseball. And he chose Robinson, an outstanding player in the Negro Leagues who had excelled in four sports while at UCLA. In their initial meeting, Ricky warned Robinson that he would face opposition from teammates, abuse from fans, even dangers from the opposing pitchers who would try to take him out with a fastball. In that meeting, Ricky asked Robinson if he would be able to endure all the harassment without losing his cool. It was a very important and very serious question. Robinson was competitive, strong, and aggressive. It wasn't natural for him to back down from anything. Foreshadowing the courage of Rosa Parks, he had nearly been court-martialed for refusing to move to the back of the bus during his military service. And yet Robinson responded to Ricky in the affirmative, a heroic resolution that broke baseball's ugly color barrier. One of Robinson's teammates, pitcher Lee Fund, was among the few players who befriended him. In an interview with Fund a few years ago, he suggested that Robinson's earnest faith was a crucial part of his story. What I found most inspiring, Fund said, was the way Jackie looked specifically to Christ as his example. Never in all my years with him, on or and off the field, did I see him lose his cool. This gentle Strength was on display for all to see, a meekness that ultimately was victorious. How did Robinson do it? According to Fund, this is the part of Jackie's story that's often overlooked. 
Jackie Robinson was a sincere Christian, Fun said, who sought to emulate the example of Jesus. In the face of injustice, he routinely quelled his anger by remembering the one who said, I am gentle and humble in heart. The one who was reviled but did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And we too are called to follow that Jesus, the embodiment of meekness. We are called to manifest, to display, to live out his meekness in the world through our lives. In our world filled with tension and strife, with fighting and ruthlessness, let's follow the example of Robinson, of Moses, so many others, ultimately of Jesus himself, by walking in a very, very, very different way. After all, only the meek will one day inherit what others grasp to possess now. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would help us in this. It's easy for us to see <laughs> It's easy for us to see how other people don't do this, so why should we? It's easy for us to see how other people get ahead by doing just the opposite. But Lord, your word is clear. I pray that you would help us to live by it, not by what comes naturally, not by what makes sense in our own mind or heart, not by what this world tells us is right or just. Oh, Lord God, we pray that you would make us like Jesus. This world needs desperately to see Jesus. And Lord, I pray that they would see him in us, in our meekness, in a world gone mad. Help us to abide in him, to draw our strength that tender, gentle strength yielded to the Spirit from Him. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close.
you would like somebody to pray with, I'll be hanging out. I would love to do that. Just a reminder, too, that uh, Sunday school class, high school, junior high, James Bible study, Sunday school, over that way, through those doors, through the other doors, around there, next to the classroom in the upper part of the church there. Just a reminder, too, of different things coming up to sign up for in the fellowship hall. And now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.